to help understand the evolution of the countries of this realm, it's helpful to go back and look at um, where they developed from that <clears throat> um, it, originally. So one time there was a Russian empire. It didn't just happen overnight. It expanded over time. And it started with this little kingdom called the Grand Duchy of Moscow, around the kind of centered around where the capital of Russia is today in Moscow. Uh, but notice that it's not near the ocean. It's kind of landlocked here. And um, what happens is that this kingdom over time really pushes outward and expands its borders. So it was landlocked, right? So it didn't, you know, it didn't have access to the ocean. Well, other European countries, and if you remember, European countries had a lot of access to ocean, a lot of the peninsulas, islands, and so on. So being the land, you know, in order to, in, so to fell behind a lot of the other European powers. So one thing it did is expanded into adjacent areas. And one thing that they were really wanting, needing to do with this expansion originally is to expand to where they had access to the ocean, that they could become, you know, a limited amount of the sea power like their European neighbors. So in fact, um, the capital was moved to St. Petersburg. I just fixed this. They, so they, they really, you know, while they were kind of in, this, in the interior of the country, they moved their capital to the outer edge, the part that was closest to Europe and closest to the ocean. And so this is an example, a different example of a forward capital, where you move your capital to kind of make a statement. We saw this with Brasilia and Brazil, and here, this was an inward movement of capital. It's moving away from the coast into the interior of the country. And in the Russian Empire, you had an opposite. You had a movement from the interior, sort of an outward looking, rather than inward looking capital in St. Petersburg. Now, the Russian Empire was what we call a land empire. That It starts out here in the, the Grand Duchy of Moscow, but then expands over land all the way out to the Pacific Ocean. And then for even a time, it even controlled Alaska, parts of Finland, and some other, um, you know, in some other parts beyond uh, what would be part of the, the Soviet Union or Russia today. Now, one thing we briefly mentioned when we talked about in North America that the United States and to a lesser extent Canada also had a similar expansion that they started with a core area like the 13 colonies and the United States expanded westward all the way to the Pacific Ocean. If you remember your American history, one key element of this expansion was this transcontinental railroad. Which you know, which connected the, the the coastal areas, the west coast to the east coast, and helped to unite this large continental country of the United States. And you have something similar in Russia as well that their expansion also included an even longer railroad called the Trans-Siberian Railway, which went that to that went from Moscow through the southern part of Siberia all the way to the Pacific Ocean. So both Russia and the United States can be considered examples of land empires. Ones that instead of expanding over the ocean, expanded by essentially conquering or colonizing neighboring areas and then um, solidifying that into a large physical territory. Now just for contrast, the British Isles were not a land empire. They were a sea empire because they were, you know, going out and kind of taking over territories using their large navy and taking over territory overseas because, you know, there wasn't more land for them to expand to. But with Russia, Russia is a land empire. And now in World War I, during the war in 1917, 
uh, the Russian Empire was overthrown during uh, the Russian Revolution. I'll call it the First Revolution because uh, we'll talk about why that is later, but this is what's generally known as the Russian Revolution. This causes the collapse of the Russian Empire and it begins the Soviet era. era. And you have the formation of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics in 1922, um, a few years after the revolution starts. Also known by shorthand as USSR or the Soviet Union. So from 1922 till 1991, what is mostly the Russian Empire continues to exist as the Soviet Union, including um, the Central Asian countries, the Transcaucasian countries, and countries, some of the countries in Eastern Europe, including the Baltic states, like Lithuania and Latvia, and Estonia, and um, Belarus, Belarus, excuse me, and Ukraine, and also Moldova. And so these were covered in the European realm, but these were at one time part of this larger entity known as the Soviet Union. Now, one thing about being a land empire is that you have different cultures as well. So um, the Soviet Union encompassed um, a number of different cultures in these different areas that they had kind of pushed into. Um, very, we're gonna talk about some of the cultures in the Caucasus regions, very ethnically complex. Um, Kazakhstan is gonna have some things more in common with maybe the Middle East in some ways than with Russia. But the point is, is that it's not all one single Russian culture. Now it was developed with the idea of it being a federation. And we've talked about federation. These are power sharing agreements between states and federal governments. But the reality is that Russia was always such a dominant part of the Soviet Union that it was, it was the, it's where the power really lied. And it was Russia, the big, you know, big part of the Soviet Union that had control or sway over the rest. So the idea is that you had a Russian Soviet Republic, you had a Kazakh Soviet Republic, but the, the non-Russian ones are always weaker and controlled by Russia. And one way that, you know, going back to the Russian Empire and continuing through the Soviet Union, one way that Russia maintained a dominance is a policy called Russification. This is a policy of moving out people, other ethnic groups from their homeland and replacing them with people with ethnically Russian people. And so the result of this from going back from the Russian empire and through the Soviet Union is in countries like Ukraine and Belarus, you continue to have large minorities of Russians. So in fact, in some of these places like Kazakhstan and Belarus, Russia is the official language. In others like Ukraine, Russia is spoken by a significant minority of the people, like over 30%. Another aspect of the Soviet Union is that it had a communist economy, or what we call a command economy, where instead of like individual companies making decisions, you had the central government planning and um, controlling the economy of the country. And one side effect of this is that the, where the manufacturing was done didn't have to make economic sense. They could just will their way into making um, manufacturing that was far into the interior to provide work for people deep into Siberia. And one thing that we'll see once the Soviet Union collapses is that some of these businesses in the interior start to become unprofitable and that and will kind of tend to reduce the amount of people who really want to live in these areas as well. All right, so we're talking about Russian expansion and, and I'm gonna show a video that helps to illustrate this, but when, why did they really want to expand so much, especially on the Europe side? And one reason is that they've had a long history of land invasions. So. Um, the, the Napoleonic Wars, World War I, World War II, all are conflicts where you've seen European powers push their way into Russia. 
And so Russia has really had a strong preference to try to control Eastern Europe because it provides a buffer against these sorts of attacks. There's this place called the Polish Funnel in which through lots of invasions have taken place historically. And so Russia is trying to kind of push back in the other direction to control the zone so that they have more of a buffer against attacking forces. And we also need to look at what happened in World War II as well. So this is during part of the war where the Axis powers of Germany and others, particularly Germany, had really pushed into France and had pushed deep into the Soviet Union as well. This is where they were uh, essentially ahead in the war. However, with the Normandy D-Day invasion and then also uh, push, pushing back from the Soviet Union, uh, the German armies really got pushed back. So you had the United States and its allies pushing in one direction into Germany, but you also had the Soviet Union pushing in the other direction into Germany. And this push by the Soviet Union deep into German-held territory resulted in them controlling this eastern part of Europe at the end of the war. And they really held on to that control quite tightly. So um, as the Soviet armies pushed into, you know, all the way into what became East Germany, we talked about Germany being separated, they controlled East Germany, Poland, and a number of other countries that were called the, the Eastern Bloc countries. So you had NATO countries on one side and Eastern Bloc countries on the other. And so during the Cold War era, this is a, a period after World War II when the United States and its allies and Russia and its allies were in kind of a cold conflict and a standoff with each other. Russia had pushed, uh, the Soviet Union, excuse me, had pushed deep into Eastern Europe and kind of controlled these territories after that, where the United States and Western European powers formed the NATO countries. And these were the NATO alliance was really meant to kind of put a halt to the advancement of the Soviet Union. And so Europe was really split in two. You had Eastern Europe controlled by the Soviet Union, Western Union, Europe, which was allied with the United States. And so this is going back to the concept of Iron Curtain. The Iron Curtain was the idea that you had this kind of um, split in Europe. Yugoslavia here kind of played both sides, but other than that, you had a split. Um, this is one reason why Eastern European countries kind of developed, including East Germany, developed a little bit differently than other parts of Europe. Now, just some other Cold War terminology while we're here is that you may hear, hear the first world problems or third world country. This terminology actually comes from the Cold War era where the NATO countries were considered the, the first world. And you don't hear this expression anymore, but the Russia and Eastern Bloc countries and other communist countries were considered the second world. And then the rest, the, kind of the remaining non-aligned you know, non countries, the ones that were not kind of directly in conflict, that was the third world. So that's why you might hear, you know, these third world countries, they were not part of the NATO countries of Western Europe, United States. They weren't part of the Soviet bloc. They were the kind of the remaining countries of the world. 